So uh, we've been talking about Oikos. Pastor Mike is out of town, and so he wanted me to come over and talk to you a little bit about Oikos. So if you pull out your um, Oikos Bible and turn to the first chapter of Oikos, second verse of Yogurtology. You guys are really studious over here, so if you just grab your program, I'm going to give you some really uh, good information. So you might want to grab your pen and your paper and write this down. Uh, in 1919, a guy by the name of Isaac Carrasso, uh, uh, he uh, started a yogurt company in Barcelona, Spain. Um, point number one, yogurt is old. Okay, so now in 1947, his son came to America and started the first yogurt company called Dannon in the Bronx, New York. Point number two, Sanford and Son is not the only successful father and son team. <laughs> now, in, in 2010, they went out to Portland, Oregon, and they bought an ice cream factory, and they began to experiment with Greek yogurt. Point number three, your Greek yogurt is made in the USA, okay? <laughs> So now we're done. We took care. Of, you all are going to get a grade on this when Pastor Mike gets back. Don't cheat on uh, your papers or anything like that. Make sure you turn them into the ushers. Put your name on them so that we can grade them. Now listen, this Oikos series, uh, we, uh, this series that we're doing, last week we talked a little bit about uh, Zacchaeus and uh, you know, the urgency of an Oikos. Now I'm going to give you a couple of words, uh, two Greek words and, and uh, one Hebrew word that might work. Um, uh, the first one, uh, Greek word, is okoduvia. It is family, it's kin, or it's clan. The second word I'd like to give you is genos. It is an offspring. And then there is a Hebrew word, beyeth. It means the house or domicile. Now, we're going to take those words and put them together to define what oikos is all about. Now, we're going to be talking about oikos as we go through this series from the Strong's Transliteration 3624. And in my own words, here's what I believe oikos is. It is your circle of influence. People that are around you that trust that what you're doing is right. People that are around you that believe in you. That's what oikos is all about. Now, I haven't commented on this um, uh, in the other services, but I will say this. Um, I, we are grateful, and I say we, we are grateful for the newspaper article that came out about the prison ministry that we're involved in. But I want you to know that a lot of times those newspaper articles uh, they don't have the ingredients in it to make you understand who's behind this. There are people like you that are praying for us when we walk into a correctional facility that no hurt, harm, or danger will come to us. There are people like you that have, that have signaled to your pastor that it's okay for me to bring inmates onto this campus and run programs during the week. It, it's, it's people like my wife that you have to spend nights praying when I go into high security areas of uh, uh, prisons and things like that that are saying, God, be with them that they might be a blessing to others. You don't see that. So tonight or to this morning, I'm sorry, I'd like to thank you all for supporting us in the ministry that we so believe in, prison ministry and many and the many lives the many people in this congregation that have turned their lives around when you look at the system and the way that it's represented there are over two million people that are incarcerated as we speak you have to know that that about six hundred thousand or a little more than six hundred thousand of them come home every year but more than 65 percent of them will return to jail or prison in a three-year period. 
And so it's your prayers that fight recidivism. It's the word of God. We're not just out there at acting program. As they're here on this campus, they're able to see what godly men do. And so we thank God and I thank you all for your prayers. So we want to talk a little bit about oikos. I want, to, I want you to turn, if you have your Bible with you or if you are in your, uh, have your uh, the electronic device, would you turn to Mark, the fifth chapter? Now, you, you hear about Mark uh, in Acts 12. You see where Peter has escaped from prison, no pun intended, and, and, and he goes to a lady's house by the name of Mary. She has a son by the name of John Mark. And then in Acts 15, you see that Paul and Barnabas, they get into a huge dispute over taking this guy by the name of John Mark with them on the next missionary journey. And Barnabas, who is, it's actually his nephew, he says, okay, let's take him. And then Paul says, no, we don't want to take him because he abandoned us in Pamphylia. But then you see in 2 Timothy 4.11, you see where Paul is under the rule of a psychopath by the name of Nero. He's incarcerated. And he sends for John Mark to bring all of his writing utensils and his coat. That is the John Mark that is our writer today. Even though he was not an original disciple, he is our writer recording these events for us. Now, if you want to go, just slip back a little bit. You don't have to change the page. Just slip back a little bit to Mark 4, the bottom chapters. You will see that Jesus is on Lake Tiberias, or the, the Tiberian Sea. Um, this is uh, the Sea of Galilee. And, and the winds are blowing, and, and the disciples are getting all frazzled and everything. And Jesus is downstairs just taking a snooze. And they run down like, oh, master, master, oh, this boat's going to break. This is going to happen. And, and Jesus comes out of the boat. And he speaks to the winds. Peace, be still. The Bible says that even the winds obey the God that we serve. I want you to internalize that. I want you to be thinking about that as I go to the, through the sermon, that the God that we serve controls everything. That's what it's all about. You know, when I think about what God has done for, for me and many others, I mean, it makes you fall down on your knees. Just You remember what you used to be like last year, two years ago, three years ago, and then look at you now. That's, that's the God that we serve. Go to the first chapter, uh, the uh, first verse of Mark with me. It will tell you that uh, Jesus and the disciples, they crossed the lake and they came to a region called the Gerasenes. Now, Mark and Luke record this story as well. I'm sorry, Matthew and uh, Luke record this story as well. So Matt, uh, Matthew, our Jewish tax collector, in the 8th chapter and 28th verse, he starts to talk about this. And he records that there are two men. And then Luke, our, our doctor, according to Colossians 4.14, he's identified by his profession. He actually records this in the 8th chapter and the 26th verse. And he talks about one man, but he mentions very specifically that the man would not wear clothes, signing that he was a lunatic. And, and, and Matthew uses the word or uses the geographical location, gatherings. And, and, and I just want to explain to you that the Bible is not contradicting itself when one says the Gerasenes and one says the Gadarenes, the region of the Gadarenes. I, I want you to know that just as I stand here today, one person might write 
that Pastor John was in Charles County, Maryland. The other writer, he may write Pastor John was in La Plata. They both are telling the truth. So when you read your Bible, sometimes it is good to go beyond the measure just to find out a little more so you're able to settle it within yourself. And so this writing goes on to say that when Jesus, in the second verse it says, when Jesus got out of the boat, he was met by a man that was living in the tombs. Later, it tells us that this man would scream out at night and he would cut himself with stones. As we read through this, as I, as I read through this uh, particular chapter, um, it took me to a time in my life where I worked in the mental health field. And I was working with a young man that uh, um, he, had, he was paranoid he was uh, schizophrenic. Uh, he, he also has some explosive uh, 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 anger, uh, 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 behaviors that he could not control. Uh, on the scale that they used back then in, in D.C., he was what you call a 5-5 five five on the matrix, which means that if you, if those that are in the, uh, the uh, clinical field uh, on, in the uh, uh, DSM, Access, he probably had maybe half of the disorders that was in, that were in that book, and 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 he had a record of attacking people. He was from Saint Elizabeth Hospital, and one of the things that he would do when he got upset is he get really really quiet, and then whatever window that was near him, he would just take his fist and put it straight through that window. He grabbed the glass that was hanging from the window and he began to cut himself. I worked with him for a long time and, and the, on the days when he was having a good day, back then the psychotropic medication, it wasn't like what they have now. Psychotropic medication back then was really two things, Haldol or Thorazine. That was pretty much it. And they were just releasing the uh, mental population into group homes during this period of time. And, and so this young man, when he was in his sane mind, I would ask him questions. I would say, what makes you do that? And he would tell me that there are voices inside of him telling him to harm himself. Even though I didn't know the Lord during that time, I, I knew that I wanted to be a part of helping people. I knew that even though there was nothing I could do for him, I was going to learn all I could to assist. And one of the things we learned, we learned a word called antecedents. And the antecedent was what happens before the behavior. So here's an example. Let's say somebody does this before they smack you in the head. <laughs> right? So, so after they smack you in the head a couple of times, you now know the antecedent. So, so you have to do something called redirecting that person, right? So you're going to give them uh, positive reinforcement while they're doing this. You're not going to give them positive reinforcement after, after they go upside your head, right? So you learned a little bit about the field, and you said, okay, well, I see this guy's quiet. And whenever he's quiet, he begins to harm himself. And so what I want to do is when I see him in a corner quiet, I want to get to him and start talking to him. I want to redirect him. I want to give him positive reinforcement during that time. What I was learning was that there are things that take place in, 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 the, in the world or, or, or in high places that I did not understand. When I came into the body of the Lord, I remember how a reading uh, Ephesians, Paul had been there for about three years teaching the gospel. And, and he wrote back to them right around 60 A.D. 
He, he wrote to them in the sixth chapter. He started to talk to them about putting on the whole armor of God. But in the sixth chapter and the twelfth verse, he says this. He said, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. What I'm saying to you is this. The power of God is the only thing that can change us today. We need to be vested in what God is doing with us. I'm not asking you to study anything other than the Spirit of God. Let me, let me read for you, if you go with me, Matt, uh, Mark 5, 6 verse. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. He shouted at the top of his voice, what do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? In God's name, don't torture me. For Jesus has said, come out of this man, you impure spirit. The Spirit obeyed Jesus. This takes us to our first point of the day. You have a story. And, and I don't know what has bound you, but you have a story. This man was demon-possessed. That word is not used very often often in the Bible as a compound. It's about, you, it's the word demon you'll see in New Testament only about 82 times. But this word compound, there's only a couple of authors or a few authors that actually uses this. What I want to talk to you about today is not necessarily demon possession, but displaying demonic behaviors. Let me just tell you this. Now, some of y'all, y'all ain't demon possessed. Y'all just mean. And don't want to change. <laughs> and, 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 and what happens is when Christ comes into your life, I mean, you're able to look back and see how he's changed you. I mean, think about it. I'm, I'm just going to take a shot in the dark because I don't know very many of you all. I'm just over here and I see you all, you know, with your little stickers and all that kind of stuff. Got these plugged on the back of your car and then give somebody the middle finger and stuff like that. <laughs> You know, and y'all walk around with these like the credit cards and stuff. Discount, please. You know, uh, but, but let me just let me just tell you this: there there's some things that we do in life. There's some there's some things that we've done in our old life that that lives that helps us to see that God has changed us. You know, when you ask yourself, what has bound you? What, you know, maybe you were in a relationship where, where the, the man didn't do the right thing, and now you hate all men. Y- y'all know, so just for the guys, just look straight and don't answer me in that way. You'll be okay. <laughs> but you know, some women just like, man, she must hate men. Why she act like that? And she all mean and everything. I mean, she's so mean, she can heat up a coffee cup, you know, just when you give it to her. You say, oh, but she's bound by something that the other guy did to her. And she just can't let it go. Some of us men, we're the same way. You know, some woman has walked out on us, or maybe they didn't play fair, and now we're all bound. We don't want, we don't want to open ourselves up to love. We're walking around all bound up. Some of us, some things that happened in our childhood, and, and we just can't get past them. And I understand those tra- uh, traumatic things have happened, but at some point, you have to let them go if they're affecting your forward life. Yes. And so, if there are things that are, that, that are, are, are binding you up, when we go, as we go through the service today, I pray that you'll be able to process those things. 
It may be in your small groups. Maybe you'll make an appointment with Pastor Aaron. Maybe you'll, you'll talk to that professional that you've been talking to. But it's necessary for you to do this so that you can move forward. I want to read to you. Go to the 15th verse, please. When they came to Jesus, they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons sitting there dressed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. You see, they, had, they knew that this man was uh, deranged. They had... Uh, seen his behavior over a period of time. And, and they could not believe what they were seeing. That even the demons inside of him obeyed the God that we served. James, the brother of Jesus, he, he put it like this. He, he writes, the, uh, the, actually the first writer of the New Testament, somewhere as early as 45 A.D. and maybe as late as 49. He, he actually is writing to the Christians uh, that are living in the Gentile communities outside of Palestine. And in the second chapter and the 19th verse, he, he says this. He says, uh, you believe in one God? Good. He says, demons believe also, and they shudder. There is nothing wrong with you today that God cannot fix. You understand what I'm saying? The God that we serve, there's absolutely nothing wrong with you today that he cannot heal. Brings me to my second point. You have a Savior. Now I want you to start thinking. What has he done for you? Come on. Now, now some of y'all, I'm, not, I'm just going to look straight ahead, so I'm not looking at anybody. So, you know, if you're thinking I'm looking at you, I'm not looking at you, okay? So, but some of you all, you had attitude problems, right? And don't, and don't look at the person that's with you because you won't have a ride home. <laughs> but, but, you know, some people have attitude problems. I mean, they just get upset over anything. Like, you know how, like, the lady in Walmart is getting ready to close the line? Because it's time for her to go home. She saw me coming. <laughs> you, know, you know that person, right? And, and then don't let somebody cut in front of them. Like they can really get in line and somebody cut. Oh, man, they're going to shut Walmart down. You're going to read about that. Just attitude. You know, but think today you're brand new. You're, you're, you're one of those. You want to, today you got one of these. You know, they're all, all bougie. The late, uh, oh, where the sister, the sister came up to me uh, after the service, and she asked me, she said, what's bougie? <laughs> I said, oh, oh, I gave her a proper definition. I said, that's what people act stuck up. She said, oh, I thought it was. I said, yeah, sometimes, you know, the new life people, you know, they, they sit in marching records around here. <laughs> You know, Pastor Chris, we got, you know, most churches ain't even got mulch. They ain't got no place to put it. Only at New Life. We're setting a mulch record. Come back next year. The Grand Olympic mulch record. You know, you got cookies. Cookies and stuff. You know, little blocks of cheese. I mean, you know, I mean, dainty little blocks of cheese. You know, do uh, you know people complain around here? I only got three grapes in here. I'm like, you should come to my church. We make sure it's even. You see, you see we, we have now changed our lives. And it's a good thing because, well, first of all, I'm a new life pastor, so it, there's really no such separation. So I just come over here. And I have fun because I saw a lady putting a bunch of cookies in her pocketbook last night. <laughs> and if she's here this morning, ma'am, I'm not going to identify you. <laughs> but 
But here's what I've learned. Um, at New Life, if you're a kleptomaniac, you get no therapy. <laughs> Everything is free. They don't even tell you when they're taking the offering. I always talk about that. I was like, man, what kind of church? They don't even tell you. You know, the churches I go to, shoot, they pray for an hour over that thing. <laughs> They're going to make sure you put something in that offering. You know, Pastor Mike, it's cool, man. These are offering going around. People are like, oh, okay. Here's one. Man, I better get back to business. <laughs> so, so, so as I said, you are not the old person that you used to be. That Savior has come in. He's made you that nice guy. You're no longer trying to send the email that's going to tell everybody that you were right. You just let them have their way. You know you were right. You're no longer going in on the job talking about everybody. Everybody lined up at the water cooler talking about how bad someone is. And you go in and you do your work. You're brand new. And that's what happens here. this, this, This man that everybody thought would have it wrong, got it right. He was, he was the guy that they said could never be. And here he was. I, I like the way Luke puts it. Luke, Luke says that he was sitting at the feet of Jesus. Do you know what that means? That means he's a follower. That means he changed his life. Come on, look around. Well, don't look around because that, that, that could be dangerous. But, but think about it. You know that the person beside you has changed. You've seen them when they were in their, you know, when, in that uncontrollable state. So, so I, share, um, I share this with you today. Uh, a part of this particular sermon series, um, Pastor James down in uh, Gainesville and Pastor Scott over in uh, Alexandria, uh, Pastor Eddie over here at the Dome. Um, we, we, uh, we're encouraged to share our testimony um, today as we did this sermon. And I thought back, and I, some of that stuff I did, the statutes of limitations is not up, so y'all ain't going to get it all. <laughs> but I thought about a couple of things that I did when I know the statutes of limitations are up. So, so I'll tell you that I used to have an anger management problem. Now, now you guys know me as sweet Pastor John, and I don't want to change that. So I'll tell you about this, uh, this, this thing that happened to me. Um, when I was in the world, okay, I wasn't saved during this time, you know, we used to go out to a lot of nightclubs. We used to party actually all week long, and then on the weekend we would rest. So we'd go from kind of like nightclub to nightclub, Monday, you know, through Thursday. And one night I was coming from a place, if you're from D.C., in the old days it was a place we all went to called the Chapter 3. Okay, on East Capitol Street. Don't raise your hand because that'll tell you. See there? That's going to tell your age. <laughs> so um, I'm coming from the chapter, and I pull into the gas station. And I don't know the denomination of, of money that I gave the guy, but I gave him something. Let's just say I, I, I thought I gave him a 50, or I thought I gave him 100. And um, I gave it to him. I put gas in my car, and I went back to get my change. And there was... Uh, they have this little, you know, plexiglass thing up. And I said, hey, man, I gave you, you know, I gave you a 50. The guy was like, no, 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 you only gave me a 10 or 20, whatever it is. I was like, no, 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 I, I gave you a 50, right? You know how it is. Those of you that are suffering from ra- rage, you know what this is going to come to, right? Because you know you only give them, what, one or two times they look. I just told you, right? <laughs> so I got all irate, and, and, and I started acting crazy. So I, you know, I spit on the window. I told the guy, you know, what I was going to do to him. You better get my money. I'm going to do this and that. And the guy was calm. He, he must have he must have went to new life because he, <laughs> he, was, he was all calm. He was like, sir, I gave you the correct change. You know, you don't want to hear that kind of stuff. Like, man, stop talking proper. <laughs> you know, this is a fight. You can really get in a fight. Don't be talking about, excuse me, may I? You can really get in a fight. So, so I'm telling this guy, you know, hey, man, you better get my money. So I just went crazy. You know, God forgive me. So um, I went, they had a little ice cream thing there. So I went and started stealing all the ice cream. 
So I figured they were worth about a buck a piece. So I was stealing all the ice cream and stuff and putting it in my car. And then, um, and then he wasn't upset. He was on the phone calling the Capitol Hill police and stuff. You know, and you know back then you don't have enough sense enough. You don't, you don't have enough sense to be scared of the police. You be like, oh, you scared of the police? At the police, all this sort of stuff, right? So I'm going in there. So during this period of time, this is the funny part. My wife cracks up on this. Um, I, for, I was a vegetarian for about 30 years, and the only thing he had in there was like Slim Jims. <laughs> so I stole all the Slim Jims put the Slim Jims in my car, and that still didn't make them mad. So they had all these uh, Reese cups or whatever you call them. I, I stole all that stuff, and I was like, yeah, I got my money. You know, that rage, that rage was on me. So I got home, and I had all the stuff, you know. My wife looking at me like, for me? <laughs> so I had all these Slim Jims and all this stuff like that. Guess what I found in my pocket the next morning? Yeah. The bill that I thought I had given him. I went back to the gas station. You know how it is when you got to put your tail between your legs. And I went back to pay for it and to, to make this right wrong. But, but I look back over my life, the, the Christ in me now, the devil in me then, and I see this new person. And guess what? I like him. So you can't, you can't get me upset anymore. And look, I'm going to tell y'all right now, um, don't try it. Because last night, somebody left here, and they was oh so funny. He's like, Pastor John, you got Slim Jim? <laughs> you know, they was trying to get me riled up again. And I was calm because I had one of these. See, see, understand this. Let me, let me read this scripture to you because I don't like long sermons and, and neither do you. And let me read this scripture to you, okay? Um, go to the 18th, drop down to the 18th verse. It says, and Jesus was getting into the boat. The man who had been demon-possessed begged him to go with him. Jesus did not let him, but said, listen to this, go home to your own people, your oikos, and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. You know what Jesus wants us to do? He wants us to talk to our friends. And, and, and in order to do that, you have to be living a life worthy of them listening to you. You know, I, I hear people all the time, oh, Satan, I rebuke you. And it looks like they're living for the devil. And the devil don't know who they are. Um, here's one for you. Um, Acts 19, 13, the seven sons of Sceva. And they saw Paul casting out devils, and Paul would go, in the name of Jesus, you be healed, and, you know, he would cast out the demons. And the seven sons of Sceva, they saw Paul doing that, and they said, ooh, that looked like fun. We're going to try it. The Bible says that they went to the demon-possessed man. They said, hey, um, in the name of that Jesus that Paul was talking about, we want you to come out. Here's how the Bible reads. It says that the demon said to them, Paul, I know, and Jesus, I know. But who the blank are you? It don't really say that. <laughs> it don't really say that, but I figure a demon probably would say something else. <laughs> you see, you have to understand this thing. We have to live. You can't divide yourself from who you are. You dance with the devil all week. Could you imagine the devil probably saying, oh, now that you're with your church friends, you don't know me. <laughs> you can't dance with him all week and then want to come in church and get all holy. I'm blessed and highly favored. And one more person say that to me. Blessed and highly favored, Pastor John. You know, that's a thing that they do. Like, how you doing? I'm blessed and highly favored. No, no. Come on, let's talk. Let's talk about transparency. There are things going on in all of our lives. You know, it's, it's time to grab a friend and say, hey, man, look, this is what I'm going through. 
Can you, can you help me? Can you, can you give me some direction? Um, um, you know, it's time to get with the counselor. It's time to, to, to get on the phone and, and call someone and say, this is what I'm going through. It's time for us to open up and be who we are. Because I'm telling you right now, while you're busy trying to be someone else, nobody is being you. Which means your issues are not being processed. God has given us a savior. You, you have everything that you need. Every, everything that you can possibly think of is before you. The God that we serve. This scripture, tell, this passage tells you that he can heal anything that's going on, whether it's uh, clinically diagnosed or not. The, the, him being able to calm the winds on the seas tells you that things that man cannot capture, he can. This is the God that we serve. Look at this. You have an oikos. People around you, they're watching. They're, they're watching you punch out. You're supposed to leave at 4 o'clock. They're watching you punch out at 20 of, and you got the Bible on your desk. You're going you're gonna to have this great Bible study at lunchtime. They're, they're watching you not fill out a leave slip when you're supposed to. They're watching you whenever you feel like you're mad enough to say anything that comes out of your mouth. Now, after you've done all those things, Guess what? They are not going to ask you for prayer. After you join together a couple of, um, I, I don't know, some of you in here might have had this problem. I know this is new life. You all are prim and proper. But has anybody had, don't raise your hand, have you had a problem with profanity? So, no, I, I thought not. Nobody here. <laughs> so I'll tell you a little bit about profanity, you know, because, you know, in the, I, I, there were some words that I used to know. I don't do it anymore. But, you know, there was an art to profanity. You know, you got to fit those cusses in strategically. <laughs> you know, when you get ready to cuss somebody out, and I, I, I recognize that I'm talking to a congregation that has never had those issues. So point number one, you know, but, but you learn this one thing, that when people hear you talk like that, they're not going to call you and ask you for prayer. You, 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 you got to cut, you got to cut all this mess out. And, and I know some people say, Pastor John, you're a little legalistic. Oh, you know, you don't want nobody to drink. You don't want nobody to smoke. Now we can't cuss. That's why we don't come to your house. <laughs> and, and I get it because that's why my relatives don't come. You can't do none of that. But, but, but listen to this. Listen to this. When they get sick in the hospital, guess who they call? When their sons and daughters are in jail, guess who they call? When, when, they're, when, when their friends are sleeping in homeless camps, guess who they call? Why? Because around my oikos, I'm doing what I preach. I want you to understand this for everyone in the room. I never study the Bible so I can preach. I study the Bible so that I can live this. And if someone wants to know or someone wants to hear from me, yes, I'm ready to preach. But I'm telling you right now, if you, especially if you're in this room and you're studying ministry, let me tell you something. I'm going to give you a good ministry lesson. If you can't live this, shut up. That's what this is all about. Amen? I'm going to end on that note. Pastor Aaron, please pray, pray for us. God bless you in the name of Jesus.